So in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 10, the Bible reads, Take heed to despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you, that in heaven your angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to, uh, to uh, save that which is lost. How think ye, if a man go have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and go into the mountains, and seek that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of the sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. And the title of the sermon this morning is Seeking Those That Have Strayed. Seeking Those That Have Strayed. And of course, we see here in this verse that uh, that was Jesus' mission. That it was Jesus' mission to seek that which was lost. Uh, and that he, he says right there in verse 11, The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. So that was the very mission of Christ. That's why He came to earth to seek, to seek and to save that which is lost. And of course, it just goes without saying that in order to save that which is lost, that which is lost must be found, meaning that the lost must be sought. You're not going to find something that's lost if you never look for it. Right? I mean, that, that sounds pretty reasonable, right? I think about the fact that I don't have my wedding band on because we lost it. You know, I set that thing down and, and and it's been missing for a while now, and uh, there's one place we haven't looked, and that's the, the couch. <laughs> and I'm not, I told my wife, we're not going to look in that couch, because that's the last bastion of hope of where that thing is, <laughs> right? Because we have another theory what happened to it, and if that's what happened, then it's gone for good. So we're holding out hope. I'm just thinking maybe one day we'll get ambitious, probably when we move, and <laughs> take that thing out. We'll turn that couch upside down and shake it, and hopefully I'll hear something clanking on the floor. And, well, here's the thing, that ring's going to stay lost, as far as I know, until I, I look in that last place, and it might even stay lost after that. So that's just kind of, you know, a pretty obvious illustration that if you don't seek for something that's lost, you're never going to find it. And again, that is the mission of Jesus Christ, that He came to seek and to save that which is lost. The Bible says in Luke 19, and if you would turn over to Luke chapter 14, turn to Luke 14. The Bible says in Luke 19, you're going to 14, but the Bible says in chapter 19, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So in order to save something, in order to find something, you have to seek it. And that demands effort, doesn't it? That means you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to put forth some effort. And it's going to demand that you be uh, you know, sent. It's going to demand that you be, uh, in order to put effort, you're going to have to be exhorted to do so. We're going to have to be exhorted. We're going to have to be encouraged. And really that's the point of the sermon this morning is to encourage you. I really don't think that we're struggling in this church in the area of soul winning. You know, we, we've, we've pretty much got that down. But here's the thing. This sermon is really to remind you of why we're seeking the lost. Remind you why we're going out week in, week out. Uh, some of us multiple times a week to go out and seek that and save that which is lost. Why are we doing that? That's what I want to remind us of this morning is why we're doing it. Because here's the thing, when you set out to be a soul winner and you've determined that you're going to be part of a soul winning church and you're going to continue in a soul winning church and you're going to soul win for the rest of your life, you understand the importance of going out and seeking that which is lost. There's a danger of falling into ruts or maybe seasons in your life as a soul winner where you start to just do things out of routine. Where you just start to say, well, it's just what I do. And it can, it can just turn into something you're doing solely out of habit. And you know, we, we can all fall into that. And you know, that's probably perfectly natural to do that. Just like you would do anything else, anything else in life that you're going to do over and over for, the, for, a, for a long period of time, you know, the newness wears off and it can just turn into a little bit of just doing things out of duty. And by all means, you know, we should have the character to pull ourselves through those type of seasons where we feel like we have to force ourselves to do certain things and soul winning is no exception. Sometimes we have to just make ourselves go and do it because we know it's the right thing to do. Maybe we're not excited about it, but that's the point of the sermon. I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you. And I want to remind you not to just fall into this routine of soul winning. And I don't know that any of us are there, but it's always good to, uh, you know, try to have some preventative maintenance. So, because here's the thing about seeking uh, those that have strayed. Seeking the lost, seeking those that have gone astray. It's inconvenient. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. I mean, there's a reason why this church, as small as it is, has more soul winners in it than some Baptist churches that have hundreds of people in it. Right. I mean, there's soul winning, there's Baptist churches out there that are running hundreds, and they have less soul winners than we do. And I don't say that braggadociously. I don't say that to lift us up. I speak that to their shame. But here's why is that? Because it's not easy. Because it's inconvenient. It requires effort. 
And a lot of times, those the efforts that are put forth in soul winning, they, they, they're not going to be uh, exalted before man. They're not going to be lifted up. And, and, and you're not going to get the recognition or, on this earth. But, you know, seeking that which is lost is difficult. I mean, Jesus, in the parable where we read, I'll remind you what it says. He says that if he, he leaveth the 99 and goeth into the mountains. You know, we're getting, we're getting ready to have that camping trip up there in, in Mount Lemmon. And I'm glad we're driving up there. Because I probably wouldn't make it halfway. I probably wouldn't make it a quarter way before I had to turn back around and, and go back down and, and, you know, and give up, basically. Right? It's difficult to go up into a mountain. It's not convenient. The sheep was, had gone astray somewhere that was difficult to go find it. So, you know, that's why a lot of people are not doing it today. It's not convenient because it requires putting forth some effort. Now look here in Luke chapter 14 and verse 6 and it says, Then he said unto them, A certain man bade a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to come to them that were bidden. Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must know if you go, uh, need to go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife. Therefore, I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. So in this example here, of course the primary application of this passage is dealing with the fact that God is going from those that were bidden, the, the, the nation of Israel is turning unto the Gentiles, those that were not bidden. But there's also, I believe, a principle that we can use here to apply to soul winning and the fact that it's not easy, that it's something that requires effort. Because in this example, we see here that the difficulty seems to increase, doesn't, doesn't it? I mean, first the people that are, are he goes out to seek and to save are those that were bidden. I mean, they had already gotten the invite, they already knew the date, they already know where to be and when to be there. I mean, they really didn't have to put any effort at all. And then, of course, it goes on there, you know, they didn't show up, so what does it say down there in uh, verse 20, 21 towards the end? It says, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. So you see, it gets a little bit more difficult. Now he's going to find people that had no idea about the marriage supper. They had no idea about the wedding that was taking place. They, they were just, you know, going about their daily lives. Now he's like, well, now you need to go find these people. But even then, they're going into streets and lanes, aren't they? They're going into places where it's paved, maybe, where there's a, a road they can walk down. There's a footpath. You know, there's no obstacles in the way. There's a lot of people already there. But it's not as easy as going and getting those that were already bitten, just going to remind somebody that already knew what was going on. So the difficulty gets a little bit more difficult. But then, of course, there at the end, it gets even more difficult where he says, and the Lord said unto his servant in verse 23, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. So now they're going a further distance, maybe where there's not as many people. They're going into the hedges, you know, having to go through this, this difficult obstacles. But in both examples, the one of the mountain and the one here, is that the difficulty of the journey is re worth the result. And that's what I want to remind us of this morning, is that, you know, it's getting hotter out there in Tucson. You know, and I know we like to brag down here that it's a little bit cooler than Phoenix, but it really doesn't matter at that. You know, when it gets over 110 degrees, I don't care how if it's two degrees cooler, it's still hot, right? Right? But that the difficult, you know, the journey is going to get a little bit more difficult over these summer months to go out and be faithful to soul winning. But you know what? The result is still the same. Yeah. The result is just as rewarding if we were doing it in the middle of January. You know, we're seeking those that are lost, those that would never, might never come to the Lord otherwise. See, because here's the thing. The people that are being sought out in these parables, they cannot find their own way. A lot of them cannot find their own way. I mean, think about that sheep on a lost, on, lost on a mountain. I mean, a sheep does, doesn't, you know, sheep are pretty dumb animals from what I've been told. They don't necessarily know where they're going or yeah. how to get there. That's why they require shepherds and things to, you know, corral them and bring them to certain places. Otherwise, they'll just wander around and they'll remain lost. That's like that sheep. And that's what we're dealing with with people out in the world today. They're like sheep, on a, you know, scattered without a shepherd. These people can't find their own way. That's why we need to put forth the effort. Although it's difficult, although it gets hotter, although you know maybe we're, we've been doing it faithfully and we feel like we're just 
starting to do things out of routine, let's not forget that the result is still the same. We're still finding sheep. We're still bringing them into the fold. They're still being saved for eternity. All right. <coughs> in our example there in Luke, <coughs> who do they go and seek? The poor, the main, the halt, the blind. I mean, the poor, they can't hire a guy. They don't have the money. They can't pay some man to show them the way. The maimed and halt, they're incapable of walking. They can't even physically get to where they need to be. And you think about the blind. I mean, unless somebody comes and takes them by the hand, they're not going to get where they need to be. You know, and spiritually speaking, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people that can't buy their way into heaven. We're dealing with people that, you know, are, are, are have a lot of sin that's, you know, damaged them. They're damaged goods. They, you know, maybe they don't think straight in certain ways. And they're blind. They spiritually can't understand the gospel. Yeah. And except some man should come and show them, they're not going to understand oh, the, these spiritual truths. That's why we have to put forth the effort, although it's difficult. Amen. Because if we don't endure that hardness, if we don't out and go and do it, they're just going to remain like remain like that sheep that's out there. So seeking those that have strayed, you know, it's difficult. It's something that uh, is inconvenient. It means going out of the way. But also, seeking those that have strayed is a big mission. And that's a big task. And if you would, you're in Luke, turn over to chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. You're going to Luke chapter 10. But I'll remind us just how big the task is before us of seeking those that are strayed. It says in Mark 16, of course we all know this verse, and He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, there's no clause in that verse. There's no exceptions. It's all the world. It's every creature. That's a big task. Yeah. You know, and it's going to take a lot of people to accomplish that. The task of seeing those that have strayed is large because everyone is strayed. Why do we have to reach the whole world? Because everybody's lost until they get saved. The Bible says we know these verses in Romans. For uh, death passed upon all men for all have sinned. We know the Bible says in Romans that there is none righteous, no, not one. They are all gone out of the way. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Why is the task so large today? Why is it so inconvenient? Why is it so hard? Because they're all lost. Yeah. Because we've all gone astray. Because we've all wandered from the fold. <clears throat> so we have a large job to do. I mean, we think about just that map back there of the city of Tucson. I'm looking at just within the city limits right now. And that map doesn't even encompass everything. There's probably another third of that city that's, you know, east of there that we don't even have on there. And, uh, you know, Brother Fabian and I were out to dinner here up on um, that Mosaic Cafe up there. What, what do we have? Biscotto? Oh, yeah. I don't yes. know. Am I saying it right? I'm probably butchering that. <laughs> How do you say it? Biscotto. I don't know. Biscotto <laughs> or I don't know. It's number 11. That's right. <laughs> this is when I go up there. Number 11, right? But we came out after supper, and I remember we looked out, and you could see that whole, that whole city of Tucson at night. And I just thought, man, that's our city. That's the city we got to reach. That's the city that we've been given to go out. Yeah. That's our. I mean, that's over a million people represented. Yeah. And we got to go out and reach them. That's a big task just for us, just for this church. And I remember I've said it to him, and I said it to my wife in the past. I said, you know what? I mean, it's good for us to have goals in life. We ought to have, uh, you know, especially as men, we have to have some, you know, task that's bigger than ourselves to to accomplish. You know, we have to have some kind of a battle. We have to have some kind of a goal in life to keep us motivated and enthused and, and occupied and something to strive for and to work for. You know, turning that map red, not saying, hey, I was part of a church and I helped knock every door in Tucson. Man. Yeah, that's a that's a worthy goal. Yeah. Right? That's a big task. But I'm up for it. And I, I'm glad that I'm in a church full of people that are have the same vision and have the same desire. I mean who knows, maybe we'll knock it twice. You know, we we could we could knock that thing three times. Right. I mean, I'm not even 40 yet, right? I still got time. We can do it. Right. I can get on at least once. Yeah. I'm sure we can get at least once. Yeah. We've already put a debt in it. But, you know, it's a big task. It's a big mission. Jesus said all the world. Of course, he doesn't expect just any one group of people to do that. But we all have to do our part in order to reach the whole world. And you know what? Tucson is the, is the corner of the world that we have to knock. And I don't want us to get discouraged just by thinking, oh, we're just filling in the map or just painting... You know what? At least we get to go back and just you know take the marker, you know, and, and color it red, and then next week we'll do it again. Let's not get discouraged. Let's not let routine just you know bog us down. Let's not forget that the goal and the results are still the same. That souls are still being saved. Yeah. So yeah, it's a big task, but you know what? Jesus, he set the example, didn't he? 
He set the example of seeking out and doing the work. He didn't just say, hey, go do this, and I'm not going to show you how it's done. He led by example. That's what we see in Luke 10. Look at verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before His face into every city and place. I love this next phrase. Whether He Himself would come. Whether He Himself would come. It wasn't that He was just going to send them out there and do nothing. And just sit back and let them do all the work. No, you know what he did? He said, I'm gonna and I'll follow you. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So it wasn't that he just sent people out and didn't and didn't do likewise. He sent them out and then he followed right behind them. And him and you know elsewhere it says that he himself went out and preached. And of course we know that's what he did for those three and a half years. That he went out, you know, throughout all the cities and villages and into the hill country and and uh, preached, you know, in multiple places. And that's what he spent his time doing. The man was homeless while he did that. He had nowhere to lay his head while he did that. That's how dedicated he was to the task. So Jesus, yeah, he gives us a big task, but he set the example, didn't he? He appoints others, and then he joins in the work. And then, of course, we have to consider the fact that, you know, we might feel like we're kind of going out of our way. And we are. I mean, we are. We're going out of our way. But that's, that's the point, isn't it? You know, we're not. We can't. We don't want to turn these Calvinistic churches that just thinks that, that, that the lost are just going to walk through those doors, and then well, then we can just have altar calls and just bring people down the aisle. It doesn't work. Right. I mean, I'm sure you can get some people saved that way, but are you going to are you going to get an entire city? Saved? Are you going to get every creature saved at an altar call? You're going to have to go out of the way. You're going to have to be inconvenienced. Amen. And Jesus set the example. And let, let's not forget that Jesus went farther out of the way than anyone ever will. I mean, Jesus, you want to talk about somebody going out of their way for another person. It's Jesus Christ. All right. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'll read from Philippians 2. The Bible says in Philippians 2, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now that's crazy to think that our Lord, the God of the, uh, the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, took upon him the form of a servant. I mean, he's worthy of, you know, of, of, of praise and service and just to be exalted throughout all of eternity and to have people come and serve him. But what did he do? He went way out of his way. I mean, he left glory. He left heaven. He left his Father's throne and came down to earth and took on sinful flesh like you and I, of course, yet without sin. And it, walked, you know, it was tempted in all points like as we are and knew all the same struggles and trials and temptations that you and I go through and was made in the likeness of men. I mean, you feel like you're going out of the way to go knock a door? You can stop and consider the fact that our Lord went much farther out of the way and not just for that person at that door, but for you yourself. Amen. See, he did all that to because here's the thing, he did he did that. He went out of his way to seek those that have strayed. And that includes you. And that includes me. That includes everybody in this room. Because all have strayed, haven't they? Look at there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That through that you through whose poverty might be rich. So whose whose sake was it for that Jesus came and was made a likeness of sin flesh for your sakes, for our sakes, for me and you, even in this room. You see, Jesus sought us out when He came and died for our sins. Yep. When He was dying on the cross, when He suffered and, and was buried and rose again, He did that, all that for us. And not only that, you know, in all likelihood, someone went out of their way to preach you the Gospel. You know, someone maybe came to your door one day or, or you know, took the time to to uh, make a DVD with the gospel on it and publish it and put it out there and, and, and promote it and things like that. Or somebody took the time to sit down with the Bible and open it up and explain to you how to be saved. Someone did that for you. you know, so let's not forget that we need to be doing that for others. We should be returning the favor. And again, I'm not trying to say that we're not doing it. Because we're doing it. I'm just trying to avoid us from falling into the, 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 just doing it out of simply out of routine. We don't want to. We want to always keep our burden and remember why we're doing what we're doing. The Bible says in Romans 10, "How shall they hear without a preacher?" Amen. You know, it takes a preacher. It takes somebody going and preaching the gospel in order to get somebody saved. It all rests upon those that are willing to preach. The Bible says, "If our gospel be hid, 
It is said to them that are lost. I mean, it's great to know the gospel, to know that you know you know it, you understand it, you get it, you're gonna, you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. But what about those around us? You know, and there's certain people in your life that probably only you can reach, or you have a much better opportunity to reach that I can never reach. You know, your relatives, your friends, the people that you associate, the people that you know. You know, I'll, I might never run into them. You know, I might never uh, get a chance to give them a gospel. You know, and don't ever feel like, well, if I fall out of soul winning, or if I don't. If I don't do it, you know, somebody else will. And that's a mentality that's out there. And that's a mentality that was expressed to me very on in my Christian life, and it didn't do me any favors to hear this mentality of, well, you know, if they're really supposed to get saved, God will send somebody. They'll get saved if they're supposed to. And then he'd ask that same person, are you Calvinist? No. Are you sure? Because you sound like one. Yeah. When you say, oh, we'll get saved if they're supposed to. And that sounds like a Calvinist. Well, I mean, how do you say How can you just say that? Well, you know, if I don't give them the gospel, somebody else might come along and do it. Yeah, they might, but then again, they might not. You know, you might not be, you might be just that one person that they're willing to listen to. Right. So, just remember that. That, you know, we're, we, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, it might be awkward. Yeah, it might require us having to go out of the way. But without us seeking, they might just remain lost. And somebody did the same for us. Our Lord did it for us. And we need to return that favor. You know, and, and you know, maybe by chance there, there's people in here that, uh, you know, that are are able to go out slowing. And I understand not everybody can get out week in and week out. You know, that people are busy with their lives and things. You know, moms and uh, raising kids and stuff. Um, you know, they're raising soul winners. Praise God for that. You know, but if you are able to get out and go soul winning and you're not, you know, my my question is why not? Why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you learning how to go out and give the gospel? You know, a lot of people don't do it because they're afraid. Just because they, it's you know, it, it is awkward. I remember when I first started, I was like, "We're going to go knock on a stranger's door <laughs> and ask them if we could talk to them about the Bible." Yeah. You know, I got nervous. I had right. butterflies in my stomach. I I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. And I found out real quick. You know, it's, it's a lot of it is just my own imagination. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, Rambo isn't going to answer the door and be like, "What are you doing here?" You know, <laughs> sharpening his knife or something. Right. You know? A lot of people, the, you know, the worst thing I've ever had happen is somebody just slam a door. You know, I slam doors. <laughs> Not that often. <laughs> and when I do, I'm wrong, right? But that's the worst thing that's going to happen. Someone's going to say no. Someone's going to slam a door. Someone might call me a name. You know, you learn to get over that. In fact, you know, you might even get to the point where you kind of enjoy it a little bit. <laughs> it's kind of entertaining, you know, to break up the, the, the mundane, uh, you know, people who are just not interested, no thank you. It's good to get that one every once in a while that's just, no, you jerk, you know, you got a story to tell when you come back, right? But when, when you start soul winning, you don't have that mentality, you're like, oh man, we're going to go soul winning, what's going to happen? You know, so maybe that's why some people don't go. Well, you know what, here's the thing, you can go, and you don't even have to do the talking. You know, we could pair you up with somebody that'll do all the talking for you. You right. can just sit back and enjoy the show and, uh, and and learn how to do it. But here's the thing. I'm guessing that, in fact, I, I almost know for a fact that pretty much everybody in here is going so winning. So, the, the, you know, I'm kind of preaching the choir on that one, but, you know, the application for you is, you know, don't let seeking those that have strayed just become a matter of routine. Just become a, a force of habit and you lose your burden. And that's easy to do because soul winning is hard work. It's, it's not easy, especially in the heat, especially um, when you're doing it consistently, especially if you're going into an area that's not as receptive. You know, but you need to not weary. Go ahead and turn over to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. I'll remind us Galatians 6. We know this verse where it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So, how are you going to avoid... Letting uh, soul winning just become just something you do out of habit or being just routine. You're going to get weary when you get weary. So don't be weary. Well, how do you avoid wearying yourself? Because that's easy to do. It's easy to say, well, you know what? I'm going to go out soul winning two, three times a week for multiple hours on end. And you do that long enough, I guarantee you're going to reach a point where you start to get weary. You know, and especially, if, and especially if you do go to somewhere that's receptive where you're giving the, the gospel a lot. But well, here's the thing. Here's what you need to do. Pace yourself. You need to pace yourself in your soul winning. You know, uh, only, go, only doing, you know, what you can. You know, sometimes we all, of course, we want to push ourselves and do more, but we have to remember that 
we're trying to do this for a lifetime. We're trying to knock that whole map, right. not just one part of it. Mm. You know, we're trying to reach the whole world, not just you know one one street. So you need to pace yourself. You need to make sure that you're being consistent. Yes, and there's times to amp ramp it up, and there's times to scale it back a little bit. But we always need to be pacing ourselves. Look there in Colossians chapter four, verse five. It says this: Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. So you need to walk in wisdom. He didn't say sprint. He didn't say run. He didn't say you know an all-out dash. It's not a marathon. He's saying you need to walk in wisdom towards that or without. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to how you ought to answer every man. See, people burn out, and from and, and you know what they do? They cease walking in wisdom. They stop to have the wisdom towards them that are without. Because you have to be wise as serpent, and harmless as doves when you're out there. You have to be wise about how you're going to go soul winning. And, 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 the, and what I mean by this is when they lose their wisdom at the door is they're losing that burden. Their burden. They're not being wise about how they're you know, representing the gospel of Christ, how they're trying to uh, implore somebody to hear the gospel. That takes a certain level of wisdom. It takes a certain level of, 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 of uh, people skills or having the right attitude, right? right? And people, when they burn out, when they don't pace themselves... They lose that wisdom when they walk towards them without. And here's what happens. They become robotic. And I've seen this. And I've done this. I've been guilty of this. You just turn into a robot at the door. And I've, and I've, I've pointed this out to different people that I've seen it in because I know exactly where they're at. They're faithful soul winners. They go. They're, they've got a burden. They, they want to do the work. But they're burning out. And you can see it. And they're going there in an unreceptive neighborhood. And they're burning out. And they become robotic. And it's real easy to do. <clears throat> you know they uh, they just they just start go reciting a, uh, a script. You know we have to have some some script to what we're doing. You know, but make sure it's just, you know it's not just this. You're, you're not you're just repeating it as if you're already expe expecting them to say no. You know what you're burning out when you start. You're like well, we're from a Baptist church. You knock their door. We're just wondering if we can give you an invite, and you're already walking away just waiting for them to say no. <laughs> you're already expecting it. And one thing a lot of people do. One thing I used to be really guilty of. You know, as they would exploit this thing that, you know, here's the thing. With uh, people subconsciously, if you just walk up to them and you hold something out, they'll take it from you. See? <laughs> and they won't even know why they're taking it. Right. They'll just reach out and grab it. And one thing I would do a lot, and this is a one little point in soul winning, I think that goes a long way. I don't have an invite on me. When you take an invite, a lot of people that say, hey, we're from a Baptist church. Do you go to church anywhere? And they're holding the invite out like that. And the person at the door, now they're opening their door and they're taking it. Here's a little tip. When you're handing out your invite, say, can I give you an invite? I'd say, hey, I'm Brother Corbin Russell. Or I don't say I'm Brother Corbin Russell. Hey, my name's Corbin. I'm from, a, from, a, from, a, from, I'm from a Baptist church. We're just going around your neighborhood today and we're handing out invites. Can I give you one? And what, when you ask that question, you know, one, they feel like they're being invited to accept the invite. They're not just, their subconscious brain isn't just like, I'm being forced to take this. I don't know why I'm taking it. I don't want it. And when you ask them, can I give you one, this is where you're going to be more efficient and help you from burning out because now you're giving them an opportunity to say, no, thank you, not interested. Because I don't want to waste my time with somebody that's not interested. I want to find out as quick as I can whether or not that person is going to let me open up the Bible and share the gospel with them. All right. You know, and I and I, so that's what I do. You know, and I try to stream like streamline those first few moments at the door. I mean, seconds as quick as I can to get to that point. So that was one thing, and I pointed this out to a guy, you know, uh, up in Phoenix just recently. I said, hey, you know, you should ask them if you can give them. And he, you know, what he did that because at first he was just doing that. Hey, I'm from a Baptist. I'm from Faithful Word Baptist Church. Do you go to church anywhere? And they're taking it. And people were, without even realizing it, because it's a subconscious thing, they're like, no. And they're, they're, hot, they're a little hostile. Because they're feeling like you're just kind of, like you're going to break out a sweat lamp and just be like, where do you go to church? You know? Right. And, then, and it's, it feels like an interrogation. Right. Yeah. We don't want to do that. We want to walk in wisdom. Right. You know, we want to be warm. We want to invite them to church. We want to feel like they, they would, we would actually like to see them there. Hey, can I give you an invite? That's inviting them, you know? So that's just a little tip. It's just instead of just putting it in their hand, ask them if you can leave them one. And uh, you know, there's going to be people that are disinterested, and that's another thing I see people get burned out on. They get they get burned out on people who are disinterested and rude, and they they get discouraged. 
This is especially when you're first starting soul winning early on. I notice that a lot. I struggle with that for a while. People that be rude, man. Because here's the thing. you got to learn to shake the dust off your feet. you okay. got to. Because here's the problem with that. If you let some jerk at one door give you a bad attitude, you're going to take that attitude to the next door. And go, let's see what this jerk's going to be like. Yeah. And they haven't even come to the door yet. And you're already convinced that you're just going to be dealing with another jerk. Right? So you need to get that get that out of your mind as quick as you can. Just, you know, when I don't, I don't care how rude they are. I mean, to, to a point, of course. I mean, if they're just being belligerent jerks, then... That's a different story. But the average person, most doors are just like, hey, I'm not interested. Or no soliciting. You know, no thanks. You know, or the ones that have a really polite way of being rude to you. No thanks. You know, not like the guy I had the other day. No! I didn't even say anything. I just knocked on the door, he opened it. No! I'm still shaking the dust off. Right? I'm still a little bitter about that one. But don't let that discourage you. And that's what a good soul winning, by the way, partner will help a person with. Is they'll, I, whenever I see that happen to my soul winning partner, and if, they, if I think they're struggling with getting over it, you know, if they start, you know, reciting, you know, let your gold be with this against you. <laughs> your, your gold and your, you know, is moth eaten and, you know, the rust of your gold. So you know, you howl and weep and mourn. For the, you know, at this guy, it's like, whoa, buddy, <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> Maybe he's just having a bad day. For all you know, he was walking to answer the door in a great mood and stubbed his toe. You know, and now he's blaming you for his stubbed toe. You don't know what was going on. You know, I've had people answer the door and say, it's just not a good time. You know, that man, maybe that's really what it is. It's just not a good time. So whenever I'm with that and I see that going on, I say, I try to get their mind off of it. You know, start talking about something else. You know, and I'm taking the next door and try to get them to think about other things rather than just stewing on, you know, somebody who might have just been having a bad day. So <clears throat> here's the thing. We don't want to burn out. You know, we got a big task to do, so we have to pace ourselves and make sure we're not turning into robots at the door and being discouraged by those pe people that, you know, are unreceptive. Because here's the thing, you know, you have to understand this. You have the rest of your life to win souls. You have the rest of your life. Now, who knows how long your life's going to be, right? We know it's a vapor. But, you know, the, the natural course of events are going to be here for a long time. You're going to have lots of opportunity to go soul winning. You know, you're, you're part of a church like this. I mean, different events going on. You know, uh, there's the entire life before you to go out and, and, and go soul winning. However much of your life you got left, you can go soul winning. Yeah. You will accomplish more by not burning out, by pacing yourself, by not getting discouraged. So how's another way to not get weary in soul winning, to not become discouraged? Well, how about a change of scenery? I know that helps me a lot. You know, sometimes when you're in the same neighborhood week in and week out, and it's unreceptive, you maybe just switch it up a little bit. Go to a different soul winning time. How about this? Come on a res trip. You know, shameless plug. Come on a res trip. Yep. Schedule one. You know, I, I know we could get the dates out a little bit further, and that might help things. We'll work on that. But, uh, you know, come on out on a res trip and go out to some of the most receptive soul winning you'll ever be a part of and enjoy the fellowship yeah. and the recreation and be reminded again that soul winning can be, you know, not only, uh, you know, work, but it can also be fun. Try a different soul winning time. Go with a different person. You know, maybe you're going with the same people every time, switch up partners. How about this one? Go visit another soul winning church. You know, uh, if you ever go take a vacation or something, maybe plan it around visiting another church. Hopefully if you're going on vacation somewhere, you're considering where you're going to go to church while you're on vacation. And you can go to another church and go soul winning with a whole other group of people in a whole other city and, and be refreshed. So that's another way to not become weary. So you don't want to... Uh, let seeking those that have strayed just become a matter of routine. So don't we're, don't become weary. Pace yourself and realize that there is a harvest. The Bible says in Psalms uh, 126, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, bringing his sheaves with him. So there is a harvest to come. That's what that verse tells us, that there will be a time of reaping, that there will be a time when we are bringing our sheaves with us. And you have to understand that seasons come to an end. I mean, this is liking it unto you know agriculture here. There's a certain time of year that there's a harvest. Harvest doesn't happen year round. And it's the same way in our life. There's going to be a harvest at the end. Yeah, we're 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 you know winning souls along the way, but we really won't see the harvest, the true fruit of our labors, until our life ends and we reach heaven. And and God shows us, you know, because the Bible says every man's work shall be made manifest. 
when God shows us the results of the efforts that we put forth. So yeah, seasons come to an end. There is a harvest. And it's true that you have your whole life to, ahead of you to go soul winning, but also remember this. You only have this life to win souls. Yeah, yeah you have your whole life, but that's it. You don't have any more than that. And that there is a reward for your labor. <clears throat> Realize there is a harvest. That you're, you know, Don't get discouraged in the fact that, you know, thinking, well, does, nobody notices. Nobody cares. Nobody, you know, it's just some red shading on a map somewhere. It's just some numbers in a bulletin. No, God is going to make every man's work made manifest someday. The day shall declare it. It shall be revealed by fire. And every man shall receive a reward for his work. Uh, if any man's work which, abide, uh, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So there is a reward for your effort. Though you might not see in this life. So don't let that uh, burn you out either. And probably last of all is keep a burden. Keep a burden. And that's really what I'm trying to... Uh, emphasize this morning or, or help you do is to keep a burden. It says there in Psalm 126, it says, Though that reap, though uh, th those that reap uh, sow in tears. You know, maybe sometimes we're not getting the same because we're not going out with a burden and we're just too much of a robot at the door. And you know, and I don't think anybody in here is like that, but it could happen. I've been there. We could just go out, well, it's my soul winning time. Let's go see if anybody's interested today. That's not a burden. Yeah. You know, often when we pray, when I pray for the group before we're going to go out, you know, if I pray, Lord, give give us a burden for the people in this neighborhood. Amen. You know, Wednesday night in Nawatuki, I mean, that's fervent prayer. <laughs> I'm down on my knees. <laughs> Please give us a burden for these people, right? Because it is unreceptive. It's hard. It can be. But we have to keep a burden. Remember that if we sow in tears, we weep. It says, those come again rejoice. Those that come again rejoicing, those are the ones that went forth weeping. They didn't just go forth. They went forth with a, with a burden. So you have to keep your burden. And here's the thing. You have to have a burden because if you have a burden, a genuine burden, you know people are going to sense that. The lost, they sense whether or not you're really sincere about wanting to share the gospel with them. And even when they can sense it, they're still not going to be interested in some, I mean, often. But at least you're coming across as genuine. and not. They're not going to close the door and think, boy, that guy is out there for no reason at all. He doesn't even care about what he's doing. Why should I? Mm. <clears throat> you know, if they're not interested, at least they say, well, at least that, I could tell that guy really wanted that. Maybe what he had to say is important. He seemed like he really wanted to share it with me. You know, I could just tell by looking at him, just by the way he's talking to me, that some about what he had to say was, was really you know, on his heart. And maybe the next time, if there is next time, somebody comes around, they'll be more open to it because you had a burden. People, people sense whether or not you have a burden for them. And that alone sometimes can open up people in the gospel. And sometimes that's the only thing that's going to open up. So let me just conclude by this. So, you know, we share the same mission as Jesus Christ. We share the same mission as Jesus when we go out and we seek those that have strayed. That's our mission. And it's a big task. It's monumental. It's a, it's a very big task. And it's going to require a lifetime of effort from all of us. And we're only going. Uh, we're only going to be do. We're if we're going to uh, contribute. If we're going to do all that we can uh, to contribute, we have to not get weary. We have to stay burdened, and most importantly, we have to go. Right? right. We have to go. You can have the burden, and you can say, "I'm, I'm not going to get weary." You can be as energetic as anybody, but if you don't go, you know, you're, you're not going to accomplish that. And we're only going to go when we remember that ye were a sheep going astray. You know, that's going to be a big part of you keeping that burden. Yeah. And you having that desire to go. So remember that Jesus did all of that. Just the people that we're trying to reach are the people that were in the, are in the same position that you used to be in. That you were one time a sheep going astray. Let's go ahead and pray.